Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Road to Growth podcast. We have uh, Stephen Wilcox here. He is the founder of Park It. And I know some of you are watching uh, this on YouTube. Others are listening to it. In the background, he has his uh, boy who chairs. There, there we go. Trying to move out of the way for you. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Trying right on his surfboard and his uh, uh, his reels. and You're very outdoors now. Yeah, you know, um, I spent my whole life basically chasing waves and chasing snow. And uh, my girlfriend and I own a camper van. So we do a lot of things outdoors. And it ultimately kind of led to the creation of our product, the Voyager and the company Park It, um, which we'll get into further. But yeah, living life outdoors is realistically, I think, the best way you can spend your time. So we, have, we do what we do our best. So what what's a bit better workout on the surfboard or on the snow? Oh, um, so people who don't surf. Every time I take them surfing, they come back and they tell me that they like couldn't sleep that night because their body was so sore and they've used muscles that they didn't know that they had. Um, uh, but I get more beat up snowboarding. Like I think it's just a level of consistency. When I go snowboarding, I like can't walk for a couple of days, but I'm great here. And the people yeah. I take surfing for the first time, they're like, no, I just stayed in bed the next day. I couldn't move my arms. I couldn't move my legs. Your core is super tight. Uh, so I think surfing is probably the better workout, but uh, snowboarding rocks me on my socks. <laughs> Fair enough. So, so let's get in. We talked about a little bit about your company. Uh, mm -hmm. So tell a little about kind of what your company is and about the chair. Yeah. So uh, the company's name is Park It. You can find us online at parkitmovement.com. Um, basically, the, the mission of the company is to produce products that facilitate the enjoyment of the outdoors and align with community building. Um, and really just creating that space for people to connect with one another on a, on a more personal level. And, you know, what does that more than spending time around a campfire, sharing the stories of the massive fish you caught with your buddy five years ago, or the big wave you caught in Indonesia, or the, the powder day that you had in the Sierras, uh, more so than a chair. And so what we did was we, we identified that that was an area within the market that we could effectively innovate and uh, build a brand around this product. Um, and the most exciting thing was launching it on Kickstarter and seeing the momentum take off with it. And, uh, the chair is called the Voyager. Um, it's got a bunch of features built into it, which we can get into, but you know, that's kind of the synopsis real quick. So re understanding a little about you, you're kind of a, a serial entrepreneur. You've been having this kind of deep down to be entrepreneur. And I think when you think of entrepreneur, it's like thinking of an out the box idea. And a chair has been around for a long time. I mean, how did you know this was going to be your nugget to kind of push forward? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, like, you know, a, a chair. So a lot of people at first, they didn't really understand. They're like, you're, you're building a chair. And I'm like, yes, I recognize that to a lot of people, um, this sounds like a very interesting task to tackle. Um, it wasn't so much that it was the chair as much as it was the brand and what we knew we could build a, around the focal point of what the chair is. You know, like I mentioned just a bit ago, the chair symbolizes to us something more of community. Um, it symbolizes the stories, it, it, the people who sit in these chairs. As uh, it, it draws together, you know, an ability for people to get to know each other in a way that social media has eliminated. Um, we spend a lot of time, you know, scrolling Instagram and talking to people who we don't really know anything about and, and with the climate that exists today, uh, it can be a very negative experience for a lot of people. And, and we know that our products and our company as a mission would be able to kind of bring all that together. Um, in terms of identifying, you know, the chair as the focal point, it was actually kind of a unique light bulb moment. Um, we were sitting around a campfire with a bunch of my buddies and uh, one of my buddies went to go sit down in his chair and the whole thing just ripped. And I remember looking over at it and going, one, that thing is a piece of crap. Um, you're going to throw it in the dumpster as soon as we're done with this. And he had to spend the rest of the night sitting on the ground in the dirt, um, using the backrest up against like a rock or something, you know? And that was kind of the light bulb moment for us where we realized that we could build this brand around what we love to do, um, which is all the outdoor things that we've mentioned. And on top of that, you know, build a product that was going to have all the features built into it and the quality built into it that wasn't ever going to put somebody in a situation like my buddy found himself ever again and uh, build a product that lasts a long time. You know, a lot of people buy these outdoor chairs as a seasonal purchase where they come back at the end of the summer and throw it in the trash. Next spring, they're back buying another one. Well, that's just filling up landfills and causing waste. And by building a durable, high quality product that's gonna last, uh, we're able to eliminate those types of hazards to the environment. Did you have a background in how to start a company? Where did like grow up? Where did you get your 
kind of grow your knowledge of? Oh, so I've been um, kind of self-taught in a lot of things in life. Uh, my dad was an Air Force navigator and my mom was a teacher. So business acumen wasn't really what I was raised with. Um, but I went to school at Chapman University and I was a business degree, business major there. Um, and I focused actually on finance. Um, I thought like the stock market was going to be the thing for me. And I quickly got an internship at Merrill Lynch and like turned around the next day and when like saw kind of what they were doing and was like, all right, you're going to finish this internship, but I don't think this is what you want to do for the rest of your life. And so that was uh, the pivotal shift where I recognized that what I was most passionate about was the outdoors. And I need, we needed to start figuring out a way to weave uh, my professional life and my personal passions together. And I knew it could be done. Um, I spent a couple of years outside of college working for Oakley and Quicksilver. And um, those two experiences, I think, are the, are the main reason why I was able to build the confidence within myself. Because that's, that's the biggest piece of the puzzle for any entrepreneur is having the confidence to, to walk that path on your own so that you can do it. Um, Oakley, when I was there, I got to see the inner workings of an absolute machine. Um, you know, like there's a reason that that company sold for a couple billion dollars to Luxottica. Uh, there's a reason why it's one of the number one performance eyewear brands in the world. Um, and they continue to dominate that place. Uh, Quicksilver, on the other hand, was a completely different experience. I got to Quicksilver and within two weeks of being at Quicksilver, the company filed chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, and had, you know, in the sense of on one, one hand, I have Oakley who has just been an absolutely efficient machine. On the other hand, I've got Quicksilver and has been inefficient in the way they've been operating, hence this chapter 11 filing. And so through those two experiences, I got to see best practices and I got to see the mistakes that one company had made. And then I got to help one of those companies be it Quicksilver reassert themselves into a dominating place within the action sports industry. And after doing that and seeing what it took. I recognized a lot of these things I can do on a much smaller scale, and that will allow me to build kind of the lifestyle design that I want for my life, where we own our own business, we operate our own business, but we still have the freedom and flexibility to pursue what it is that we're passionate about and align those and marry those together. And that's kind of how, you know, the whole story of what motivated me to become an entrepreneur came to be. All right. So there's a, there's a couple items right there that I kind of want to take away. The first one you said is that you can uh, merge your passion with your business. You knew you could do that. I mean, how do you know you can do that? Because I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners, and some of them say you can't always have your passion with your business, and you were dead set confident that you could. So how do you know that? Um, it really came through. Um, it's, it comes with this little trifecta that I talk about sometimes. I have a, a couple interns that I've worked through, and I teach them this. This is one of the first things I teach them is, it's the digital trifecta. And if you can master how to utilize Facebook advertising, um, how to master Shopify website optimizations and master Adobe Creative Suites, um, you can effectively create content, distribute that content and generate sales. Um, and if you're able to master the trifecta, everything else you know is, is a branch of that core, of those core three services. Um, you can pr pretty much like private label some t-shirts or private label some water bottles, like you know, whatever it is you want to do. And you can start to build your own brand. Um, and that's, you know, branding is my core competency. Like if I look at what I am overall, am I a business owner? Yes. Um, am I a surfer and an adventure hound? Also, yes. Uh, but when I think about what my like number one core competency is in the business acumen, it's brand building and it's building those experiences for people that they want to engage with um, that, you know, there's a reason why we look at Nike and everyone idolizes what the athletes uh, that represent Nike mean. And there's a symbolism behind all of them. Um, and so if you're able to identify that and you can, you can build a mission out of that and you can master those three uh, company or three skill sets that I just mentioned, Facebook, Shopify, and Adobe, um, you can start to drive really whatever it is in the direction of which you want it to. Now it's definitely challenging. I don't want to make it sound like it's a walk in the park, become a Photoshop expert and start selling stuff. No, that's not how it works. Um, but those three things are, are the main pieces that allow you to kind of conjoin lifestyle design and entrepreneurship, depending upon the business that you have. Now, where did you learn that, that idea? Was that from school? Was that from Quicksilver? Was that with the companies? Um, I learned that actually from a lot of agencies. And so my roles at Quicksilver and Oakley um, were focused more on marketing and support for the tangible marketplace. So I was building when you drive like, you know, when you drive the five freeway here in, in San Diego County and you see a big billboard and you see an Oakley thing on it. I was responsible for managing the production and, and creation of those those major marketing pieces. Um, 
now it's a little bit different, you know, like, like Facebook, when I was at Oakley had just IPO would they didn't have an ad platform yet. Um, nobody really knew what, how Facebook even made money. I remember they IPO would on the New York stock exchange and immediately went down in price. And now I look back on it. And I'm like, why didn't I know to buy any, <laughs> um, you know, that's another story for a different day, but Facebook's completely changed the way that a business goes to market. You know, like we were in a, at Oakley, we were effectively like, Hey guys, here's a bucket of cash spend this money on whatever you think would be cool to help our sales team sell stuff. And like, you know, that was fun. We got to have a lot of creative ideas. Now it's, Hey, sales team, um, place all these things in these stores because we need that type of brand equity marketing team, uh, create this. What's the click through rate on that? What's the metrics off of that? What's your return on ad spend from all of that? Is it profitable? If it's profitable, keep going. If it's not profitable, let's go back to the drawing board, create something again. And that's, that's a, like a huge pivotal shift in the marketplace that no one really has anything on. Um, you can't really go to school right now and get classes on it because as soon as you take a class on it, you know, Facebook changes the algorithm and it's complete. What you just were taught was out of date. And so a lot of it was self-taught um, through basically just following different agencies and signing up for their newsletters. And just over the course of the last five or six years, uh, that information is just, you know, been reiterated over and over and over again. And you start to recognize the paths to success for what these agencies are offering. And you start to implement that for yourself. Being that uh, Facebook is such a leverage point for you, do you ever look at the avenue? If Facebook was gone tomorrow, how would I get my business? Yeah, I remember there was actually like a year ago, Instagram crashed. Um, and you know, we weren't selling anything a year ago. We launched on Kickstarter this spring. And, but I remember that day and Instagram was down for a full, like 24 hours or something. And we were like, Oh God, like what if this happens again? And it's like black Friday and every single company that's been trying to advertise on black Friday, like can't get any of those ad dollars out and can't generate any of those sales. Um, it's a definitely like a risky thing. Uh, but it, you know, like hopefully that doesn't happen. We, we won't want that to happen, but you know, with the way 2020 has been, you, you never really know what you're <laughs> going to get. Uh, but in terms of what we would do, you know, like that's where, like, I think the experience from Oakley and Quicksilver starts to regenerate itself um, and become more of the focal point of like, this is how these companies grew to this size. And you have to, you know, with a consumer goods product, like the Voyager chair from park it, uh, we want to put that thing into REIs and Dick's Sporting Goods and Shields All Sports, places like that, and open up a wholesale distribution channel, um, which from the position of a, of, a, of, a, of a brand, you're not necessarily sure if you want to do that. You're adding more hands. Um, you're potentially adding more customer service problems. Like, like our, with the direct-to-consumer model that Facebook and Google um, and all these other digital platforms have enabled, you really get to be the owner of your customer's journey. Um, they, you know, they find you through your portals. They land on your website. They go through a shopping experience um, specifically catered, uh, specifically designed by you. Uh, if someone goes and buys this at the local surf shop down the street or the or the or the REI in their in their area, they're going through an REI shopping experience. If that makes any sense, and. Um, yeah. You know, not that that's a bad way to do it, but that's, you know, Facebook and Instagram are gone tomorrow. That's that'd be the route that everyone would have to pivot to is let's go back to finding the wholesale distribution. Uh, who are the gatekeepers to that and who wants to move those things through? So it becomes a little more challenging as an entrepreneur, um, you know, a, a story to this. And then I will wrap up on this question. My uncle um, is a uh, label printer. And uh, when coronavirus hit, we were supposed to launch on March 18th. And if everyone remembers what March 18th was like, people were panicking buying toilet paper. And my uncle, uh, we were supposed to launch. And my uncle calls me. And he's like, are you going to do it? I'm like, no, we're hitting the brakes. Um, like, we got to let people kind of resettle. And, and the panic needs to subside. And, and consumers need to get back into their normal lifestyle before we present a product to them that's basically, basically saying, hey, go outside. And everything's telling you not to. And he goes, well, it's time for you to start knocking doors. I'm like, knocking doors? Like, what do I need to go knock doors for? We've got a pre-launch email list of a couple thousand people. We've got Facebook ad spend budget dialed in. And those, those, like I was saying, you know, like he had really no understanding of what that meant. And then the day that we launched, we ended up doing $75,000 in sales on Kickstarter. And he called me and he's like, holy crap, I get it. And, uh, you know, without those tools, a lot of businesses that we see today that are seeing success would be limited because there's only so many paths to success in the wholesale model. 
<clears throat> now, kind of jumping back into Quicksilver um, and Oakley, how mm -hmm. long were you at this company? So you said Oakley was kind of falling apart, or is it no, no, Quicksilver. So I was at I was at Oakley for a year. Um, okay. They were sold to Luxottica a couple of years before I got there. And one of the clauses within the deal had to do with the fact that, um, you know, uh, the owner of Oakley, Jim Gennard, was looking out for the employees of the business um, and that Luxottica wouldn't be allowed to really change the operational structure of the business for a number of for a, a period of time. Um, and my tenure at Oakley included basically the expiration of that clause. And then they came through and about half the marketing department was gone within a month. And I was one of the people included in that in that swoop. Um, and then at Quicksilver uh, was brought in by actually one of the people that I worked with at Oakley who had landed a, a role and opportunity over there and knew my skill set and knew how I could help and gave me a call and said, hey, Quicksilver is looking for this. Um, can you get involved? And I looked at everything and went, absolutely. This is like the brand that I idolized as a child. And I got there and then was pulled into an all hands meeting like in the first week or so. And it's the executive team presenting, hey, we're bankrupt. Uh, we're filing chapter 11 and we're restructuring. And I'll never forget, like a week later was my mom's birthday in Washington. And I flew up to Seattle to go see her and I'm telling her the, the story. And she's like, did you get paid this week? I'm like, I got paid. And she's like, well, all right, then I guess keep on trucking. So, you know, definitely two completely different circumstances. One acquired for how efficient and effective and powerful it is. And the other one, like fully restructuring because of the the decisions and investments that they had made and the reallocation of resources. So just all around a perfect place to be a, a young 20 year old sponge. So when did you know from, from there that you were going to start this path to building this company and coming down on, on your own? Uh, it was about a year um, into my time at, at Quicksilver. It was when I started to recognize that I was seeing real results at Oakley. It was more of a, of a maintaining um, you know, it was it, all the systems and the growth were, were kind of in place. And it was like, Hey, we grew sales a couple, like a 10, like 10%. That's exciting. Well, Quicksilver was in a place where we needed to grow sales like 70, 80%. Um, and we were able to, I was able to gain insights into exactly what those were, what those like risk were that the team had to take. Um, and when you, when you, it's like a, it's like doing a backflip. I don't know how many people in here can do a backflip. I'm not one of them. Um, but when you when you talk about when you watch snowboarders do one right they say the hardest one is the first one because you have to break the bridge of fear that's that's set within your mind and in business a lot of those things are the same like i talk to mentors all the time and explain these are the trials and tribulations of park it now and they're like yeah that's normal and i'm like it is uh you know like that's just what it is you have to become accustomed to being uncomfortable and at Quicksilver, I was thrown into a lot of situations and a lot of meetings where the strategies that we were discussing were very like not what they taught you in your business classes and not what, what something at Oakley would have done. But we were able to see the results from what we were doing. And with that, you gain the knowledge of, OK, the risk reward, like what does that look like and is it worth pursuing this? Um, and it was at Quicksilver, you know, where we started to see that. And I recognized and had the light bulb of this is becoming normal. And weirdly, I like this a lot. Uh, where do I find more of this and uh, recognize that, you know, my growth trajectory within an organization like Quicksilver was limited um, and kind of based around their time frame of growth, not necessarily my time frame of growth. And I've never been a huge fan of, of that type of situation. And um, entrepreneurship is really the way where you'll learn more and you'll grow faster uh, than anything else you ever do in your entire life, just because, you know, there's no one else to, to bounce things through. There's no one else to help catch it. And, uh, I, I honestly thrive in those types of environments. And so that was kind of where I recognized you like this, let's go do more of it. And entrepreneurship was the path to do it. Did you have money saved when you weren't getting that, that monthly or weekly check? Um, yes. Um, I, I, I've always been very fiscally responsible. Um, I had a rule right out of college that a third of my income went to savings, a third of my income covered my rent and living expenses, and then the other third was for fun money. And I uh, stuck to that really as stringently as I possibly could. Um, and, you know, thank, thank the Lord there's, there's Keystone Light instead of Stone, because um, that allows you to still have fun in your early 20s and not worry about the money that you're wasting on the, the expensive stuff. You just have to be responsible financially. And, and that allowed me to put away uh, enough of a nest egg to, to recognize, okay, you can take this risk. You've got this much of runway. Um, what happens when you run out of runway is the more you know pressing question because 
I think a lot of entrepreneurs and myself included, we jump into these ideas with the idea that we're going to start generating sales in like three to six months. I'm a marketing guy. I'm not a product guy. Uh, we built this product basically from, from a napkin sketch. And I vastly underestimated the amount of time it would take to go from pro like, like idea ideation all the way to functioning prototype to our first round of sales. Um, and so through that, I had to find solutions to keep my own roof above my head. And so I ended up becoming a brand consultant, um, which ended up reinforcing my skill set that I used to drive park it. I'm building Shopify sites, I'm building um, email segmentation strategies. And so it became this really big juggle of cool. We got the new client for the website that cash funds your roof and it goes into the business and just this cycle of, uh, you know, necessarily like the hustle, the, nece the necessary hustle. Uh, to start a business really kicks off. Okay, so now early 20s, having that idea that one third of all your money goes to savings right there yeah. is I think a very uh, adult thing to have. And a lot of 20 year olds, even business owners, I talked to someone the other day where they were doing drugs at 24 and now they got their life back on track at the age of 30. You know, um, so where did that come from? Was that from your parents kind of putting that into you? Was that self kind of, Taught self mindset or yeah so my parents definitely had a huge influence on that um we my parents gave us a small allowance as a kid and you know you're responsible for certain chores and mine was mow the lawn trim the bushes uh sweep the front patio um take out the trash for your mother all those types of things you know that you contribute to your home and, and they gave us a small allowance of like i think it was like 50 bucks a month um which as an eight-year-old is exciting like 50 bucks buys you a video game right um, my brother went that route. He was always the one buying the video games. It was like, cool. An Xbox came out safe for a couple months and he'd buy the Xbox and I'd be like, well, cool. I live here and uh, I get to use the Xbox. But I was always in the mindset of like, I don't have any other way to make money. Um, my parents give me this allowance. When I turned 13, I got my first job as an umpire. And so I was umpiring right away, uh, making money in the spring and the fall with little leagues and pony baseball. And I was always just stuffing that cash away on the premise of like, your parents aren't buying you a car. And when you turn 16, you're 100% getting yourself a car. And um, when I turned 15, my parents, un unbeknownst to them, um, that I had been saving for years, uh, looked at me and said that they would match whatever I could put forth to buy a car. And I was like, ooh, okay, well, this is going to be exciting. And uh, when it, I ultimately turned 16, I had turned and looked at them and showed them this wad of cash that I had been stuffing in my desk um, like basically like 3,500 bucks, uh, from all the umpiring jobs and from all the savings of the allowance over the course of the, like the prior five to six years. And they both kind of looked at each other and were like, oh crap, <laughs> like what did we just do? And so I've always had that mindset about just fiscal responsibility and, and that experience, I think being at 16 really just trained me to be, this is how you get the things that you want in life is you have to be fiscally responsible. And you can still have plenty of fun on a, on a small budget. You just have to get creative about how you do it. Oh, and, and you have that, that goal right there. Cause it was the car back then. And what was it later in life? Is it basically get your company to a certain level or what's that? The goal in my early twenties was more so to just get to a position where if I, if I was ever let go or fired, I would have savings. Um, that was like the first thought process. Cause like you graduate from college and you get this like first time real job and, you're making like forty-five to fifty-five thousand dollars a year on average for an entry-level salary, and like that only goes like so far in terms of like your goals of what you want to do in life. And I think one of the challenges, especially for the millennial generation, is that we kind of looked at that and we're like, "What? What do you mean?" Like, like there's this bit of entitlement with our generation that I'm certainly at fault for um, in the early years. But I recognize like, hey, if you've set this up this way and set this up this way and set this up this way and you stick to these, like you have to be disciplined and stick to them. Um, you know, you're gonna have the rainy day fund. That way, if your tire blows, you can buy new tires. If your transmission blows, you can fix your transmission. Um, that was mainly the thing for me was just creating that security. And then after you reach that security level, it just became, well, how much more can we keep getting into this? And then that started to circle back into what I went to school for with finance and the stock market and finding opportunities to, to take what I had saved and grow it. Um, and turn it into the opportunity that presented itself was like, hey, you've got the capital now to potentially get this business going. Uh, what do you need to do? And it, it just kind of snowballs from there. So, so we talked about before we got into the mic, basically the peaks and the valleys. Can you kind of walk us through basically some of the 
the, the low moments of kind of building your business? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the, the low moments of starting a business, um, there's a lot of them. The, uh, to really think about them, I think from, from a business standpoint and an entrepreneurial standpoint, there's two different types of low moments. Uh, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, there's a lot of emotional lows um, where you just kind of feel like the world's against you. Uh, you feel like there's no one you can talk to that will relate to it. Um, it is a small niche of people that do, you know, the things that entrepreneurs try to do. And it's very hard sometimes to, to look at the challenge that you've been faced from the business side. That is that, that low for the business and figure out from a personal side, like how you need to react to that and how you need to, to, and then who you can contact, you know, to give you advice and steer you in the right direction and, and basically be that voice of wisdom that helps you, you know, figure out the solution. Um, so there's a lot of those types of lows where you just kind of feel alone in what you're doing. Um, but what's beauty about one of the beautiful things about entrepreneurship is that through those lows, you find those resources and the community of entrepreneurs is very different from any other community that I've ever been involved with in my entire life. And I'll explain why. Um, and I'm going to use a bit of a surfing analogy for it. When you go surfing, the goal of surfing is to basically find a perfect wave all to yourself that you don't share with anyone and you have a great day. Uh, when you go snowboarding, you want to get to the powder before everybody else, before it gets all chopped up. And, and really, you know, it's very like, like the, it's very isolation, uh, very isolated, um, in terms of what, like what the end goal is in entrepreneurship. Um, you are out there, you know, on your own building your business, but instead of like competing with everybody, everyone's there to bring you along. And so these doors start to open up where it's like, Hey, this is the problem we have with product design. Well, have you talked to these guys? They built this product. You should call them. You call them. Super helpful, super focused, know exactly the problem that you faced and they're giving you advice on how to solve it. They open up another door, they open up another door. And before you know it, there's this incredible network of people that you can rely on that's walked the path before you and they want to bring you along. And I think that for me was one of the biggest, like, you know, the biggest peaks was recognizing that I'm not doing this alone. Yes, I am the, the sole owner of this company and I am the facilitator of of everything that that like this company wants to be, and I'm the, I'm responsible for leading it and making sure that our mission um, is positive and impactful. But like, there's a whole host of people behind the scenes as mentors and as supporters that that help make that happen. And engaging with them is you know what gets you out of those personal lows and and finding that per and finding those personal you know business highs. Uh, from the business standpoint, oh my god, the roadblocks are insane. Um, let me tell you a story about product design. At Oakley, uh, we were shown a cool pair of sunglasses and it's like, you guys are gonna market this. And we're like, cool, that's awesome. Like, these are gonna be sick. Let's figure out how we can sell more snowboard goggles. Um, I completely underestimated what it takes to design a product. Um, like, you know, I just took that for granted as a marketing guy. And the roadblocks and the, and the hurdles that you find in designing a product and making sure that it's to the specifications that your customers are going to require um, requires like the utmost amount of perfection. Uh, a product can be 95% the way there. And if you get a 95% in high school on all of your classes, you're, you've got a 4.0 and you're, you're going to Stanford. Um, if you get a 95% on your product design, uh, people are returning it and you're screwed. And, uh, that is one of the pieces of the puzzle that has been, you know, the biggest peak in the biggest Valley is like you solve one problem, right? And so you, you see how it looks in CAD and you get it built out and you test it with a prototype. And then you find out that because of that change, now there's a new problem. And so it's this constant ebb and flow of problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. And through all that is time. And time, you know, is, is one of the most anxiously painful things as you like want to get this brand and this product in front of people. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the biggest probably roadblock from a business side that's been the ups and downs is product design. Going back to having, um, other entrepreneurs that are kind of open with their time, open with their ideas and been there. One thing I've kind of noticed with talking to different entrepreneurs is it feels like the, the people that have actually been there for the most part come from the idea of abundance, mm -hmm. right? So they're willing to give back their time. Yet the people that maybe aren't there yet, sometimes they come from kind of a scarcity mindset mm -hmm. and they're not as open to give you their time or give you their ideas on things. So how do you find the right people to, to be, be in front of? Um, great question. 
um, a lot of it comes down to trust. Um, and what builds trust is honesty. And one of the things, and I think this is a bit of a misconception, uh, it's, I don't want to downplay it um, because it is definitely a problem in the entrepreneurial world. Um, but, the but there's a misconception that if you share your idea with someone, they're going to steal it. And I think um, one of the things that led to this cultural thought process is the movie, The Social Network. And we all know the story of the Winklevoss twins and Zuckerberg and, and how that's all panned out. You can go read it. I, I read all the court documents about it. Um, but people get in that mindset of like, that's, that's entrepreneurship. This guy's going to take my idea. Uh, not necessarily the case. Like the majority of the people that you're going to be connecting with as an entrepreneur are in that early stage. They're in the first five years of their business. Even if they're in the first 10 years of their business, they are so consumed with the problems that they're facing day to day that for them to take your idea and go, Oh, I'm going to do that because I can is so unlikely. Um, and when you, when you're honest with people about this is what I want to do, this is my idea. This is my challenge. Have you faced this before? And what can I learn from you? You're one, you're telling them that you're giving, you're giving them the opportunity to be that point of authority and be that, that role model and figurehead, which a lot of people, they love that. Um, and with that, you're, you're breaking down kind of the, the competition and you're breaking down that, that fear in the first place of like, this is what I'm worried about with this conversation. You don't bring that to it. You bring just positivity and, and gratefulness for, for their expertise. And it just tends to open up basically a, a river of knowledge that you're able to pull from and learn from. And, uh, you know, another element is finding the people who are building within like the type of industry or product or, you know, business service that you're building. Um, and finding those mentors because they're out there. You just kind of have to stick your hand out and say, hi, I'm Steven. This is what we're building. And you've done this before. I'd be honored if you, you know, be a point of resource for me to learn from. And nine times out of 10, I'd say the answer is absolutely. Give me a call anytime or shoot me an email whenever you need one. Well, and you'd find those people through like, like Facebook, LinkedIn, or what platforms were you most successful on finding those individuals? Um, I actually just find them through conversation in real life. Um, okay. Most of the time, I feel like the conversations I find on LinkedIn are people trying to sell me something. Um, I changed I changed my bio from digital brand consultant to founder and CEO of Parkit, and literally within like a week, my inbox on LinkedIn went from like five to three to five messages to fifty. And I'm like, yeah. all right, well, something happened here. Uh, I changed my title to the decision maker, and now everyone is trying to sell me something. So I've never really used LinkedIn as a resource. Um, I'll use it to vet people. Like if I meet someone or I find someone on Instagram who I recognize, hey, you're a brand builder and you have a direct to consumer business. Um, I'll go through, you know, their Instagram profile and vet them to see like how authentic are they to their brand and their business? Does it seem like they work hard on it? I'll go check them on LinkedIn. Um, it sounds superficial, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're getting advice from the right people. It's the reason, you know, your podcast, you probably do some element of this to make sure that the people who are coming to your show are worthwhile to have for your audience and they're gonna give some valuable insight. You wanna do the same thing as an entrepreneur because your time is valuable and you don't have time to waste when you have invoices coming in from, from contractors, when you have POs to, to manage, when you have logistics things to solve. Um, you need to find the right people and you need to find them quickly. And, they, and uh, you know, I advise you know, having a great network of friends and family, if they've done it, lean on them first. And the, from there, you know, there's the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, as some people call it. Uh, you know, you get exposed to, you call an uncle and your uncle goes, my buddy Rob did that a year and a half ago. Uh, you get connected with him through your uncle and, and it just the spider web appears. And, and that's the first step though, is just having the, the humility and the recognition to say, I don't know everything, but I'm going to figure it out. And this is my problem. Call the resources that can help you. And the, the, the doors open. Yeah, I think it's so true. Right? One thing I do love on, on LinkedIn, I've started to realize only recently because I get probably massive amount because I'm in the real estate field and it's like, oh, we sell you good leads, things like that. But I love the, the sales pitches. I see if I can take away a good like sentence from them and go, oh, okay, that's what they, how they're trying to sell me. That's their hook right there. That's that. I'm going to have to use this as some kind of marketing. So. Oh, um, I definitely do that. I, I still contract. Like I, I don't work on Parkit full time. This is still in very much the development phases. Um, our first PO is underway and I'm working on logistics things for it now. 
but to keep the roof over my head, I still contract. I still got about 10 clients right now that I do a varying degree of digital things for. And um, I've definitely received a lot of those emails from people. And I find myself in those pitches with those clients referring to what those guys might have said to me. And I'm like, that actually is a pretty good value proposition. And I know exactly how to do that. So thank you for your offer, but I don't need it today. Um, and then, you know, that cycles into, into my pitch with certain clients to, to bring them on board and get their business cranking online. So it's, it's guys, it's definite positive, positive takeaways. So what's one thing, and I, I know your current company hasn't been around too long, yet you've been around a lot of different entrepreneurs and you've accumulated knowledge over that time frame. I mean, if, if you're talking to an entrepreneur today, what is something that you've learned that would probably allow your business to grow exponentially if you learned it, you know, six months ago, a year ago, year and a half ago? Oh, um, number one is trust the process. Um, and what I mean by, I know that's a very vague piece of advice to give someone, um, but by that it's, it's very much like the, the karate kid where he like wants to learn from, from the master and, and the master forces him to go wash cars. Um, there's a reason why you are going to be doing a lot of things that you're like, this isn't what I love to do. This isn't what I wanted to do with this. And like through that, you just have to trust the process and set the principles for yourself of, I will always do my best with this. I will not give up through this. And as long as you're doing your best and you're persistent, um, the process will start to reveal itself, like the rewards. Um, you know, I am not a product designer. I'll say that every single day. Um, I'm a marketer and a brand builder. And we happen to have designed a beautiful product by working with the right people and outsourcing the skill set to the right team. Uh, but I would not have gotten there had I not driven to you know 50 metal shops in San Diego County asking them if they could bend aluminum for me. And that's one of the pieces of the process that you feel like you're just driving into a roadblock to a roadblock to a roadblock. But eventually you're going to find it, what it is. And so you just have to trust that eventually you know it's going to work out and you have to just be persistent. It makes sense. I mean, if we're talking to you in a year from now, two years from now, where is Park going to be? Um, in two years, that's a great question. Um, um, the, uh, in two years, I'm hoping that uh, we are a formal direct-to-consumer brand. Uh, we've become somewhat of a niche household name uh, where the outdoor space knows who we are. Um, you know, that's, that's really the ideal place for us to be. I, from a revenue standpoint, I'd love to be have us doing you know anywhere from from five to ten million a year. There's a company out there called Rad Power Bikes, and they did a podcast recently that I recommend any entrepreneur listen to. Um, and they're another product based startup that launched on a crowdfunding platform, Indiegogo, and and that really you know catapulted them into to where they're at today. Um, they went from their first year of sales, including crowdfunding, being like seven hundred thousand plus. And, and revenue to in uh, five years, they were doing 250 million in revenue. And this year they're pacing to double that number, um, you know, all through direct to consumer. And so those tools like Facebook and being able to use and be creative and utilize a uh, Shopify as, as an incredible web store, uh, web store hosting platform. Um, we could be in those types of shoes. I would love for it, but you know, uh, you need to be somewhat conservative because if you uh, shoot for the, if you shoot for the stars, it's not one of those things. If you shoot for the moon, you land amongst the stars kind of thing. It's 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 you outpaced your business and now you have cash flow issues that you have to solve. And so, you know, from a conservative point of view, I'd love to see us, you know, on track to to follow in their footsteps. But uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get there. Will we ever find you on Shark Tank? Oh, God, I'd love to. Um, I think our product has a lot of opportunity for Shark Tank. Um, we are not at the stage yet where we necessarily need to raise any money. Um, and we're not necessarily at the stage where we need the capital infusion. We're really still in that very early stage where we've raised what we needed to through Kickstarter. Um, and that funded our first purchase order and we've dialed in our product to a T. Um, and we're at the stage now where we need to present that to the marketplace. Um, the people who've purchased on Kickstarter, um, they need to receive their product and we need to gather their reviews and the, and the, the the first impressions from them that that early adopter crowd, and continue pushing the messaging of the bra, of the brand, and continue pushing the features of the product uh, to see what that growth trajectory truly looks like. At which point, um, from a business standpoint, as a, as an as an executive in a business, you want to go into those meetings with a lot more uh, data about your business in terms of sales figures and all that, because it gives you more 
more tools to do when you're combating with Mark Cuban or Mr. Wonderful. Uh, you know, like those guys, they're going to drill you with every question and you need to have either some form of answer for it or you need to uh, you need to know what you're going to do to get that type of information for them. And uh, we're not necessarily there yet or close, uh, but maybe we'll, you guys will see us on Shark Tank in like the next year or two. Uh, but it's something I've got my eyes set on as a goal. Wow, that was just a random thought, and I guess I got it right. Now, if anyone's listening, here, what's the best platform for them to purchase one of your products or reach out to you, uh, to your company, to kind of see what you guys offer? Yeah, so the best way to go check out the Voyager outdoor chair, um, just real quick, it's a it's an outdoor chair that is built with uh, the most quality materials. It's got aircraft grade aluminum for the framing, uh, polyester fabric, so it's soft and wooden armrest to give it that classic touch. And we've incorporated a detachable cooler. So it's really two products in one. Um, so, you know, there's so many days where living here on the coast in California, we see, you know, a dad carrying a chair, dragging a cooler and also holding an umbrella. And, you know, like those days are done with this product, sling our product over your back and you've got a cooler, you've got a chair, the cooler is welded, sealed and, um, welded, sealed and, what's the word I'm looking for? Insulated, I'm sorry. Welded, sealed, and insulated, which means that the cooler is built to maintain ice for eight plus hours, um, and it can hold 12 to 15 cans of your favorite beverage. It also includes exterior pockets for snacks, your keys, your phone, your wallet, whatever it is that you're going to put in there. If you're a fisherman, throw your tackle box in the thing, and, and you're good to go. And uh, it allows you to really just simply navigate from the car to your, to your base camp. And I think people are really going to like it. Our Kickstarter campaign proves that people love it and it's a beautifully designed product. So go out to parkitmovement.com and go check it out. All right. So you said chair, um, cooler, and uh, what was the third one? You said uh, chair, your cooler, and your pack. And your pack, but also an umbrella, right? You say umbrella too, that your dad. So when's the attachment going to be added to the chair for the umbrella? Yeah, so um, let me make sure I turn the right way. So this cup holder, right now you guys are looking at a, a 3D printed cup holder from one of our early samples. Um, yeah. That piece actually slides in and out. And so okay. through, uh, you, you can move it from the left side to the right side of the chair. So if you're a left-handed person and you like to drink your beverage from the left-hand side, you can do that. If you're right-handed, move to that side, just adding some functionality. And, and, uh, oh, is that the cooler underneath the chair? And that's, that's, a, the yeah, that's a, Yep, that's the cooler directly underneath oh, it. Oh, I can't see it. Yeah, right, I know it's a little dark in here. I got to get the lighting better, but yeah, yeah. I was like, man, like, man, it must be a really small cooler. But yeah, so people that are listening um, on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, one of those platforms, so you got the chair, and then you have the cooler right underneath it. And is there padding underneath the the chair and the cooler? Um, no, the cooler is actually attached through a series of carabiner clips on the bottom. So the cooler oh. has four clips built into it. So you can detach it, bring it into wherever the beverages are that you're going to throw into it or the snacks, whatever you're packing it with. Uh, bring it back outside, quickly clip it back on, and then uh, you're good to go. It also has carry straps, so you can sling it over your shoulder. And that way, you're, you know, if you're going fishing, you've got your fishing rods, you've got your chair, and you're ready to rock and roll. Perfect. Well, thank you again, uh, Stephen, for being on the platform. Hopefully, everyone listening got some great nuggets. If you have a passion, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a table. It could be a hat. It could be a chair. There's something out there that you can create, have that passion, have understanding of how to make it something quality like uh, Steven's done here. Thank you again. No, thank you guys for having us.